As we are talking about the land and the water today, it's important for us to acknowledge the first peoples that still exist and thrive on our lands today. So we are on the traditional territories of the uh, Anishinaabek, the Adirondack, and the Mississauga. Uh, at the ABCA, we view ourselves as shared stewards of Ontario's land and water resources along with our First Nations communities. Uh, and we appreciate and respect the history and diversity of the land and are grateful for the opportunity to work in this territory. So what are we going to learn today? We're going to go through some definitions first to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about what at risk means. We're going to learn a little bit about some fish that are at risk in the Asabo River watershed, some freshwater mussels, some turtles, and then we're going to end with some actions that you can take in your own lives to help protect these species at risk. So where is the Asable River? So if we look at the inset map up at the top here, uh, we can see that the Asable River watershed is located on the western shore or the eastern shore of Lake Huron. In fact, the Asable River empties into Lake Huron at Port Franks. Um, and it includes the communities of Varna, like up in our, uh, up the headwaters here, the town of Exeter, Hensel, Park Hill, Elsa Craig, Lucan, Arcona, Thedward, Thedford, and finally Port Franks. So why is the Asable River so important? The Asable River has about 300 out of the 600 species at risk in Canada occur in the Asable River watershed. So that's half. So we have a really important responsibility living here to take care of all of these species. The Asable River is home to 85 different fish species, 26 different fresh mussels, and 21 reptiles, along with many other plants, mammals, um, and other species. Now, the ABCA, which is who I work for, our properties are, uh, they provide a critical habitat to these species, um, and it's our responsibility to protect them. So what is a watershed? We've talked a little bit about uh, the Asable River watershed. You might be like, Nina, I don't actually know what a watershed is. So when we think about a watershed, it's important that we think shed has in the verb to shed. Not like the shed in your backyard that you keep your bicycle in. Shed like your dog sheds its fur in the spring or the winter. Um, a watershed is the area of land that sheds water into a common water body. So in this case, we're talking specifically about all the land that sheds its water into the Asable River. All right, another important definition for us today is biodiversity. And we're gonna break biodiversity down into two separate words. The first word is bio, and bio means life. So we're going to break down that second part of the word, which is diversity, and it is a range of different things or a variety. So when we put those two together, biodiversity is the range of different life forms. We also need to know what habitat and an ecosystem is as we're talking about the Asable River. The Asable River is habitat or home to lots of different species, um, and it's also an ecosystem. So a habitat is where an individual organism lives and where it can find the things that it needs to be successful. And those things are food, water, shelter, space, and mates. It has all of those things for those species. Now an ecosystem is not just about the individual, it's about all of the living things that interact together and their physical environment. So in this case, the physical environment is the Asable River, so the water and the rocks that make up the river, um, and the biological community is all of the living beings that live in the water and around the water. We also need to keep in mind the difference between abundance and population, especially for us uh, here in the Asable River watershed. Abundance is the number of individuals in a species in a given ecosystem or community. So for us, we're looking specifically at the Asable River watershed. 
<clears throat> now population, we could say the population of something within the Asabo River watershed. Um, but when we talk about population and specifically when we think about population for our species at risk and how they're categorized, they look at the population for the entire province of Ontario. So we need to remember that we might have a good local abundance of certain species at risk in our watershed, but over the whole province of Ontario, the population is actually quite small. So when it comes to species being at risk, there are a number of categories that the species fit into. I like to present it as a triangle because it kind of tells us that the higher you go up in the pyramid, the fewer individuals that each species um, are in that category. So in Ontario, there are eight species that are extinct. So that means that they don't exist anywhere in the world anymore. We can't bring them back, they're gone forever. And in fact, six of those species are fish that are extinct in Ontario, and they have mostly gone extinct because of overfishing. Now, extirpated is probably a new word for us today, um, and it's a technical way of saying locally extinct. So that means these uh, living beings used to live in Ontario, but unfortunately they don't live here anymore. And there are 12 of those species. Now we get down to endangered. These species are at risk of becoming extinct if we don't do something to help them out. Their population numbers can be quite small. Um, and in all of Ontario, there's 126 endangered species. That's quite a few. And we're gonna talk about a few of them today. There are also threatened species. There are 63 of those throughout Ontario. And these species can be very sensitive um, to natural events and human um, events that can cause a decline in their population um, or negatively impact their ability to survive. Species of special concern also have lower or declining population numbers, um, again, for either natural or human causes. All right, so why are species at risk? Now I mentioned a little bit about human factors and a little bit about natural factors. We're gonna start with some of those natural factors. In Ontario, our species can, um, their habitats and their ability to survive can be impacted by three main natural occurrences. The first is forest fire. Um, could also include grass fire, but these mainly occur in Northern Ontario um, in the boreal forest. So it's not super common for us to have forest fires here in Southern Ontario, partly because it's so humid and wet here a lot of the time. We have different tree species than um, they do up north. Uh, and so, and different humidity levels. High winds can also damage forests. So if you have species that require a lot of uh, mature growth um, in trees and they need big trees to make their homes or find food, tornadoes could come or other high wind events could come and knock those trees down, which could impact our species ability to survive. And then finally floods. Now this is more of a human impact because it's over a road, but if an area is consistently flooded, then that can impair a species ability to move around, uh, to get from place to place, or to find food or shelter. Now, our species in Ontario are overall pretty lucky, and I think we're pretty lucky as humans too to live here, um, because elsewhere in the world, species have to deal with volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes. But overall, in Ontario, our species don't really deal with those as natural hazards. All right, thinking about human activities that impact the species ability to survive, we put those into an acronym and that acronym is HIPPO-C. So those uh, six letters can help you remember these different things. So we call them the limiting factors and they include um, H, which is changes to habitat. So that could be anything from cutting down trees to, um, 
when land gets changed from farmland to uh, city land, like if you build a house um, on something that used to be a farm property, um, it could include invasive species, which are species that, that uh, have never really occurred here in Southern Ontario before. And they were either brought here on purpose or brought here by accident. And because they haven't lived here before, they don't have those established relationships. Um, and the species that have lived here for a really long time, they might know, not know how to eat it. They might not want to eat it. Uh, so that species can get a little bit out of control because it doesn't have um, any predators or any of those natural things that help keep uh, species in balance. Our first P stands for pollution, which could be anything from plastics in the water, um, plastics on the land, chemicals, um, things you can see and things you can't see. Our second P is population, and that's specifically referring to human population. The more humans there are on the planet, especially in Western countries where resource use is the highest, um, the greater the demands on the land and the greater the impact to the species who live there. Our O in hippo C stands for over harvesting and this can include overfishing and over hunting as well. We're pretty lucky we've got some good rules in place with um, how much fish you can take and when you can take fish and when you can hunt uh, that it's not as big of an issue as it once was. Um, and then the C in Hippo C it stands for climate change because as our weather here in Southern Ontario gets wetter, warmer, warmer and wilder, that is gonna impact how our species go about their lives. All right, so let's meet our first round of species at risk, which are gonna be the fish in the Asabal River. There are eight species at risk in the Asabal River. Um, two of them are endangered, the Lake Chub Sucker and the Red Side Dace. Three are threatened, the Eastern Sand Darter, the Black Red Horse and the Pugno Shiner. And of special concern, we have the River Red Horse, the Grass Pickerel and the Northern Sunfish. Now in developing this presentation, I had some good chats with our uh, fish experts at the ABCA, and they told me that although historic records exist in the Asabal River for the Red Side Dace and for the River Red Horse, they haven't found any um, individuals of these species in the last uh, number of years that they've been sampling the fish that live in our water. So we can probably say that both the River Red Horse and the Red Side Dace have been extirpated from the Asabal River. So let's meet the Pugno Shiner. So the Pugno Shiner um, is a pretty tiny fish. Uh, shiners are in the minnow family. And in fact, the Pugno Shiner can only get to be between five to six centimeters long. So it's not a very big fish. Um, and it has very specific habitat requirements. If you look at this map down in the bottom here, these yellow patches are the only places in Ontario that the Pugno Shiner lives. And we are pretty lucky that we have one of those places here in the Asable River watershed. And that place is actually the old Asable Channel, which runs through the Pinery Provincial Park. The Pugno Shiner needs lots of clear, still high quality water with lots of vegetation. Uh, and the reason why it needs that vegetation is because it eats it, so it provides food. It also provides shelter places to hide from predators like the um, great blue heron that you see in the picture here. And they actually lay their eggs uh, on the vegetation as well. So without all of that vegetation, they wouldn't be able to meet all of their life needs. So the Pugno Shiner is currently listed as threatened. When uh, the, fir the list first came out in 2008, they were listed as endangered. So it's a bit of a good news story in that it's no longer listed as endangered, 
but because its habitat is so small, we do need to take extra care with the land and the water around it. Now, when we think about fish, and all, now we looked at the eight species at risk of fish in the Isabel River, but remember there's 85 fish species that live in the Isabel River, and they all have different habitat requirements. And the cool thing about a big river like the Isabel River is that it provides lots of different types of habitat throughout its whole length. At the upper part of the Isabel River, we've got some municipal drains, some uh, smaller, shallower uh, tributaries, which are just uh, small sort of offshoots of the main river that tend to be a little bit colder. And they provide excellent habitat and excellent places for um, fish to lay their eggs if they like laying their eggs in fast moving water. We also have warm, slow moving waters like the water in the Morrison Dam Reservoir. If you've ever been to Morrison Dam Conservation Area in Exeter, there's lots of cool fish that live in there. And then because the Isabel River is connected to Lake Huron, that also provides some habitat as well because there's some fish species who will spend some time in Lake Huron um, and then some time in the Isabel River for different stages of their life. So all of those pieces need to work together and be healthy in order for all of our fish to do well. So why are fish at risk? What are the threats that our fish are facing? So we're gonna think about it again in terms of that hippo sea. So habitat alteration or destruction is a main thing for our fish. Particularly when you think about putting things like dams or weirs in the way that can um, prevent fish from moving from one part of the river to another. And if we think back to the habitats that the fish um, take advantage of, sometimes they need different habitats when they're laying their eggs, and sometimes they need different habitats when they're getting big as adults. And if they're unable to get from one place to another, that can have a really big impact on that species ability to survive. Another thing for us here in the Isabel River watershed is siltation, which is changes to the bed of the river. If we think of the name of the river, Osabel, it's actually sort of a, um, a mashup together of the words in French that mean of sand. So when uh, Europeans first arrived in the area, they noticed that this river mostly had sandy or gravelly bottoms. But with the way that we've been using the land um, over the last few hundred years, a lot of dirt uh, and uh, softer sediments have ended up in the river, changing the bed of the river, which changes how our fish are able to use the bed of the river. Um, introduced species like the common carp can have a really big impact by taking over habitat that our native fish need. Pollution such as plastics, uh, too much phosphorus or nitrogen can also impact our fish species. Overfishing, taking too many fish or taking fish at the wrong time of the year has an impact on them. And then changes to water temperature has a result of climate change. So like I said, our climate here in Southern Ontario is getting warmer, wetter and wilder. Um, and especially we're seeing that warmer weather more in the winter time than in the summer. Not that our summers aren't hot, they certainly are. But if the water doesn't get really cold in the winter, how is that impacting our fish species? All right, let's meet our freshwater mussels. So remember, there are 26 French freshwater mussels in the Asable River. Six of them are at risk. So that's about a quarter of them, or 25%, which is a lot. Three of them are uh, endangered and three of them are special concern. So all of these pictures, except for the Northern Riffle shells, are of um, an example of the mussel in somebody's palm. So you can actually sort of guess how big those mussels are. The snuff fox is probably the smallest one. Um, it fits right inside somebody's palm, whereas the kidney shell um, can be, and the, North, um, and the maple leaf mussel can be a little bit bigger as well. And we can tell the difference between these species based on the different markings that they have on their shells. 
So let's take a little bit of a deep dive into the snuff box muscle. Now, the snuff box muscle is a pretty cool muscle. It is endangered, which means there's not very many of them left in the world. Um, and it likes to live in areas with swift currents. Uh, it prefers a sandy or gravelly bottom, and it doesn't like a river that's too big. So in order to get those swift currents, rivers generally are a little bit uh, shallower, especially where we are in Southern Ontario. Um, and all mussels will eat single cell plants like algae, plankton, um, and, but they also eat bacteria, including E. coli, which is a pretty cool fact. Threats to uh, the snuffbox mussel include dams, pollution, because imagine if you were eating, um, you were taking in all sorts of water in order to uh, get the single cell organisms out of the water to eat, it means you're exposed to all of the water and everything that's in the water every time you try to eat. So pollution can have a really big impact. Uh, sedimentation, so that's when the riverbed changes. So the snuffbox muscle prefers those uh, gravelly or sandy bottoms. And if there's too much sediment or too much dirt, soft dirt that's ended up on the bed of the rivers, it can actually suffocate the muscles because they're not able to eat the way they need to. Um, and then finally, invasive species can be a big deal. And we'll talk more about how they impact them next. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you something pretty cool about uh, the snuffbox muscle. So the snuffbox muscle has a special relationship with a fish called the loghead perch. Now, the snuffbox muscle will actually lure in the loghead perch and actually clamp its head between its two pieces of its, or the, between its top and bottom shell. And it does that to help uh, spread out the baby muscles that the muscle is trying to release. So, once the loghead perch is clamped in to the snuffbox muscle, that muscle will release uh, baby muscles onto the fish's gills. And those baby muscles are called glochidia, and they kind of look a little bit like Pac-Man if Pac-Man had teeth. Um, and because the loghead perch and the snuffbox muscle share the same habitat, the muscle knows that once the glochidia grow nice and big, they're healthy from feeding off the blood of the fish through the gills. They're going to drop off as juvenile muscles into the right habitat because the snuffbox muscle and the loghead perch share the same habitat. So the reason why dams are a major threat is that if the loghead perch isn't able to get to where the muscles are, then the muscles aren't able to reproduce successfully. So why else are muscles important? Muscles are really important um, because they clean the water. Muscles, especially larger muscles, can filter up to 40 liters of water a day. That is a lot of water. So this picture was taken uh, during a festival a few years ago. We have some muscles in the tank and we can barely see through the water at all. Now, a couple of hours later, Look at that, the muscles have cleaned up the water, made it a whole lot clearer. So clear water is important for um, fish, for searching for food. Um, they're important for animals that need to eat things that are in the water to be able to see where they are. Um, and then for us as humans, especially for the Asable River, if the water is cleaner in the Asable River, it enters into Lake Huron cleaner. And then for those of us who live in places like Exeter and Lucan, um, Godrich and Bayfield, we all get our drinking water from Lake Huron. So the cleaner the water that goes into the lake, the cleaner uh, the water that the water treatment plant gets to intake, which means it doesn't have to work as hard to clean water before it gets to your taps. So why are muscles at risk? There are a number of reasons and we're gonna go back that acronym of hippo C to figure out what they are. So the first is habitat change. Siltation changes in the bed of the river have a really big impact. Invasive species, so I mentioned that has a risk for the snuffbox muscle. 
And the risk comes from the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel. So those mussels, which you can see, so this is a native mussel right here. Um, and then we've got some invasive zebra mussels on the top here. They'll actually uh, build their homes on top of our native mussels and prevent them from eating, starving our mussels. Pollution, again, because of how mussels eat has a really big impact on their ability to survive. Human population pressures, which can lead to channelization and siltation, but also from a natural viewpoint, the population of muskrats and raccoons, they love to eat mussels. And if they have really big populations, it can impact the local abundance of certain mussels. And then historically, before plastics were invented, mussels were actually used to make buttons. So especially during um, early colonization, when Europeans first arrived in North America, many, many mussels were harvested in order to supply buttons. All right, everyone's favorite topic, let's talk about turtles. So there are eight turtle species in Ontario, and unfortunately, every single one of those species is at risk. Now, out of these eight species, one of them, the wood turtle, used to occur in the Assalville River watershed, but doesn't anymore. So we would say that the wood turtle has been extirpated from the Assalville River watershed. So we are gonna meet two of our turtles. We're gonna meet our smallest turtle and our biggest turtle, but I would encourage you to look up all of them and learn how cool these species are. So the first turtle we're gonna talk about is the spotted turtle. And it's the smallest turtle that occurs in the Asable River watershed. It is 12 centimeters long at a maximum. So that's how big as it'll ever get. Even the oldest, uh, the oldest turtle will only be about 12 centimeters long. That's not a very big turtle. It is endangered. So there's not very many of these type of turtles left in the world. Now it needs to live in wetlands. It uh, will live in anything from a bog to a fen to a marsh to a swamp. Um, it will also sometimes live in the smaller streams, but it does prefer the slow uh, waters of wetlands. Now in the wetlands, it finds snails and other aquatic insects that it can eat. Um, and it can live up to 50 years. That's a pretty long time for our turtles. The major threats that the spotted turtle is facing is primarily habitat loss and degradation especially when it comes to wetlands. Also, because they're so small and very cute, uh, the illegal collection for the pet industry is a major threat for the spotted turtles. It's important to know where your pets or potential pets are coming from and that you're not uh, taking things out of the environment that shouldn't be taken out of the environment. All right, let's meet the biggest turtle in our watershed, and that is the snapping turtle. So on average, the snapping turtle is about 47 centimeters long, and that's just its shell. That doesn't include its head or its tail. Uh, so snapping turtles can get up to about half a meter, which is a big turtle. Snapping turtles are what we call generalists. They will live in almost any freshwater habitat, um, and they are not super picky about what they eat. They're omnivores uh, and about 90% of what they eat, so almost their entire diet is made up of dead stuff, so dead animals and dead plants, which makes these snapping turtles a really important animal to have in um, our wetlands and lakes because they help keep things clean. Now, in order for a snapping turtle to have to lay its own eggs, um, they need to be between 17 and 19 years old. So that means when, once a turtle, a snapping turtle egg hatches, it has to stay alive and safe for almost 20 years before it can start having its own babies. Um, and then they live a really long time, up to 70 years, which is 
roughly around the same lifespan as a human. Now, the major threat to snapping turtles um, has more to do with their late maturity and their slow reproduction. So snapping turtles will only lay eggs once a year. Um, and because it takes them so long to get to the point where they can have babies or lay eggs, they any loss of species can have a really big impact on the overall population. Now they're also at risk uh, from road mortality, which is if they get hit by cars, um, because even though you might watch a television show and you can see a turtle take off its shell, in fact, turtles are attached to their shell. It's part of their bones. Um, and so if their shell gets damaged, they can die. So even just a, even a light hit from a car can be uh, deadly for a turtle. All right, so when we think about turtles, we need to think about wetlands. And wetlands are critical turtle habitat for all of our species of turtles, all eight species um, that we have here in Ontario. Now, between when Europeans first arrived and what we now call Ontario and Today, we've lost in Huron County, about 72% of our wetland area has been lost, which is quite a bit. Prior to Europeans arriving, this area had about 25% of it was covered in wetlands, which was awesome. That's lots of habitat for all of our turtle species and all the other species that share in our wetlands. Today, we only have about 7% of those wetlands left. So why are our turtles at risk? Now we talked about wetlands already. In base of species like the red-eared slider, which is pictured right here, you can actually see its characteristic red patch right behind its ears. If you are to have a turtle as a pet, it's a long-term commitment. Even our spotted turtle friend can live up to 50 years. And the red-eared slider is no different. It's quite long living. Um, and sometimes people get tired of them and they'll just put them in their local stream or river, but they don't belong there. Um, and they can take away um, habitat and food from our native species that need it. Population, uh, so as humans, as the human population grows and we need more and more land, uh, recreational fishing can have a really big impact on our turtle species from either getting tangled up in a fishing line that wasn't disposed of properly or accidentally swallowing lures. Pollution can have an impact on turtles. Imagine if you're a snapping turtle and all you eat is dead things um, and those dead things died because of some pollution. That means that turtle is gonna ingest all of that pollution. Overhunting includes um, you used to be able to hunt turtles for food. You can't do that anymore. Um, but then also pet collection, which we talked about has a risk for the spotted turtle. Um, and then for climate change, turtles in the springtime will come out of their wetlands, find somewhere dry with a relatively uh, sandy or well-drained soil. So it's not gonna be super wet for a long period of time and they will lay their eggs there. Um, and then after that, the mother turtle's job is done. She heads back to her wetland. Um, and if the air is too warm for a long period of time, that means that the sex of the hatchlings, the baby turtles will mostly be female or might be all female um, hatchlings. And if over time you're only getting um, batches of baby turtles that are females, and then the older males start to die, then you can't make any more baby turtles. So what does the ABCA do to help species at risk? There are three main things that we do. The first is field research. So we um, collect, measure, and describe um, our fish species. We collect, measure, and note all the species of our turtles. You can see them measuring one down here. Um, and we do the same with our mussels. So every five years we go out and we have spots that we measure year after year after year that shows us um, how those populations are doing over time. We have also developed a recovery strategy um, 
that takes a whole ecosystem approach. So we think about the whole watershed, not just the river itself, but how the land impacts the water. And we work with our landowners um, and everyone in the watershed to make sure that we're treating our land well so that our waters are healthy. And then finally, we do things like this presentation today, which is education. So now that you know what the ABCA does, what can you do to help species at risk? There are things that you can do on a daily basis to help our species. The first thing you can do is become a citizen scientist. So if you thought mussels were really cool, uh, there is a cool app called Clam Counter and it comes from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as well as the Toronto Zoo. Um, and if you find a mussel shell or a live mussel, you can take a picture of it with your phone. And the app will help identify what species you're looking at. Um, and then it'll help uh, us know and the DFO know where our mussels exist. Now we do ask that if you do find live mussels, just put them back after you've taken a picture. You take a quick picture and then you put them back in the water. You do not take them home with you. Um, you can commit to not driving through any water body. So if you are someone who regularly ATV or quads, um, you never know what's in the water. So it's very important that we commit to only crossing over waterways, um, over, over the over crossings, not directly through the water. You can also refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, and recycle. So making sure that we aren't using um, too many single use plastics when they're not necessary. We want to reduce the amount of single use things that we have. We want to reuse what we have, repurpose things, has you're finished with them. And then finally, um, when you have things to recycle, making sure that you wash them out really well uh, so that it's easier for the recycling plant to actually recycle them. You can report your sighting. So if you see a turtle, um, you can report that to, especially if you see a tet nesting, uh, you can report that to us at the ABCA or you can report it to the Huron Stewardship Council. And you can take what you've learned today and help educate others. Now, we also want to look at things that we can do over our lifetime or things that are more seasonal for us to do. So today is a very snowy day, but we can imagine that spring is coming. Uh, and with that will come turtles will nest. Um, and it's a great time to plant uh, new trees. So you could help a turtle cross a road by making sure that uh, you are taking it in the direction that it is already traveling in. You can protect turtle nests, like the turtle nest protector that you see down here. And these are great to use on your own property. Um, if you have turtles nesting on your own property, because these structures are too heavy for um, our raccoons, skunks, foxes to lift up, but they have a little hole right here that the baby turtles will be able to escape out of once they hatch in the fall. Um, and then in the spring is a great time to plant new trees um, or native vegetation, which can help out um, lots of different species at risk. And then finally, over your whole lifetime, you can commit to maintaining wetlands on your property. You can even look at um, installing a wetland on your property if you're able. You can maintain your woodlots, especially wet woodlots are really important for our species at risk. Um, and if you are lucky enough to um, have a family farm, you can commit to using agricultural best management practices on your farm. So, at the conclusion of our presentation, I want to ask you, what actions will you take to help species at risk in your own backyard? If you want to learn more about some of our aquatic species at risk, there are some great videos, especially on the Pugno Shiner and the Black Red Horse on the ABCA's YouTube channel. Um, and then we have a number of upcoming presentations that we would love you to join us for. On February 2nd, we have wonderful wetlands. On February 5th, we have a species at risk presentation um, geared more to older students, so students in the intermediate grades or in high school. On February 9th, join us for some river safety 
uh, fun. And on February 12th, for those in the K to three age, kindergarten to grade three age group, uh, join us for a water and wetlands presentation. So we have a few minutes left for questions, uh, but if you have to leave, we are happy to, uh, or we're thankful for you to take the time to join us today. And it's actually 1235 now, so we will wrap this up. And I wanna say thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and I hope you learned something about species at risk. Uh, check out the resources on the ABCA website, watch the videos. Uh, on the ABCA YouTube channel and make sure you take action in your daily life to protect 